Aloha everyone and welcome to the Hawaii Pacific Gerontological Society's June webinar. My name is Mapuana Ta'amu and I'm one of the board members for HPGS and chairperson for these webinars. I wanted to start by introducing the chat box available to us all. If you toggle around your screen, you will see an icon of a chat bubble with the word chat under it. Click that button and you will enter the chat room where you are able to submit questions or comments throughout this presentation. Questions will be answered either during or at the end of this webinar, so please feel free to send in your thoughts, questions, and concerns regarding dementia, behaviors, and communication. If you aren't already, please consider becoming a member of HPGS so that you can stay updated and invited. There are various rates for individuals, organizations, and associates. Uh, there are, well, here are a few benefits you'll receive with membership. We have monthly newsletters where members are welcome to submit articles to be published. We offer free monthly webinars just like this and members are eligible to be a speaker. So we give special invitations to general membership meetings, kupuna related events and workshops. And we are very proud to offer scholarships to anyone of any age pursuing education in the field of gerontology. For more information, please visit our website at www.hpgs.org. To become a member, head over to hpgs.org and in the navigation pane, click on the membership tab. Here you'll find more information about our membership benefits. Scroll and click the link at the bottom, fill out your information and click submit. Following this webinar, it will be uploaded and archived to our website at hpgs.org. From the home page, hit the webinar tab and you'll be redirected to our currently offered upcoming and past webinars. This webinar will be added to our website no later than one week after today. So please feel free to share this webinar with your friends or family. Okay, let's get down to business. So we've gathered here today to talk about a, a positive approach to care, techniques for communication. Thank you to those of you who have been using the chat box so far. I see a few of you say hello, hello back. Um, continue to use the chat box as we go throughout our conversation today. Uh, if you have any other questions or comments throughout the presentation, feel free to let me know. Now I'm sure many of you are either a family caregiver, caring for someone at home or in a care facility. You may be a student interested in learning more about effective communication techniques or maybe a health professional seeking information to bring back to your staff. Today, I have the privilege of sharing my knowledge and experience with you all about a positive way to look at caregiving for the many challenges that dementia presents caregivers with. So today our speaker is Mapuana Ta'amu. Mapuana is the owner and lead consultant of Hawaii Memory Friends, LLC. She is a certified positive approach to care trainer and certified nurse aide with more than seven years of hands-on experience working with patients living with dementia. She alternates teaching dementia care classes at 15 Craigside, Pohainani, and the Kupuna Education Center at Kapiolani Community College. Mapuana is also a board member of the Hawaii Pacific Gerontological Society, in which she chairs the membership committee, as well as the programs and continuing education committee. She is the current president of the Kahalu Lions Club and zone chairperson for Region 3 Zone 1 of the District 50 Hawaii Lions Club organization. She currently works as a part-time registered behavioral technician for children with autism and is privately seeing patients for dementia-related behavioral consultations. With her passion for challenging behaviors, Mapuana is a patient advocate. Thank you for being here, Mapu. You're welcome. All right, as it gets into focus. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today um, for the HPGS monthly webinars today on June 27th. I wanna to talk to you today about the positive approach to care, um, give you a few techniques for communication. So things that you can use, hopefully right after you learn this, um, these few techniques, you can take this not only to your person with dementia, but even in the workplace. Um, I find that this approach works on the autistic children that I care for. Um, and even though I specialize in dementia, I like to say that this technique and this positive approach really applies to everyone of any age. Um, so feel free to share your trials and tribulations with me afterwards as well. I am a certified PAC trainer, PAC for short, it stands for Positive Approach to Care. And two years ago, 
I, along with a cohort of 20 to 25 other Hawaii residents, were taught by Tipa Snow, who is a international now mentor for this philosophy that she created. Uh, she took the Allen Cognitive Levels and her 40 plus years of experience and created a positive approach to care. So I'm really happy to be here today to share that with you. All right, so we have three learning objectives. Um, the first one is to describe the importance of sensory input, highlighting the dominant role of vision, hearing, and touch. So we all know that we have five senses, and today I wanna to touch on those three. So vision, hearing, and touch. Uh, second one is to identify and understand how caregivers are perceived by the person living with dementia. Later on, I use an acronym PLWD, and that stands for person living with dementia. We found that people who live with dementia, uh, they don't prefer to be called demented or a patient with alt, um, Alzheimer's or you know demented person. So we found that person living with dementia or people living with dementia is more of, has a nicer ring to it. So I might be using that acronym as well, PLWD. And the third objective today is to demonstrate the positive physical approach, abbreviated PPA, and the hand under hand technique or HUH. Um, normally I would do these workshops in a two hour frame. Uh, so condensing it today into a one, one hour is uh, kind of tight, but we will work with it. Also in my physical workshops, we do a lot of role playing and hands on activities to get the audience engaged and interacted. Um, so if you do have somebody nearby, Later on, when I try to explain the PPA and the HUH, you might want to grab them so that you can try it out yourself. Um, so we're going to start here. Visual data. It is the most powerful sensory input. Um, and the person living with dementia, they pay more attention to what they see rather than what they hear. So I want you to put your thumb out. We're going to pretend we're artists. So put your thumb out, close one eye and kind of look around the room. Pretend you're an artist looking at a beautiful landscape. Your thumb is gonna represent vision today. And the thumb is chosen specifically because he's on top. The thumb means that vision is king. He's on top, the vision is king. And I want you to remember that. So whenever I relate to visual data or anything visually, I'll probably bring up my thumb. And if you can do the same, it'll help with the way that you learn too. Um, Tipa Snow, who is our mentor, she, she likes to use her hands a lot when she talks and when she teaches um, because if you as a learner engage physically, the connection from your hand to your brain, it helps the, the connection more and you retain more of what you hear if you actually do some hand motions as well. Um, not only that, it is also very handy. You know, it's connected to your arm, which is connected to your body, wherever your body goes, your hand goes. So even if I did this workshop with no PowerPoint, I think it would still be um, very beneficial because we have these other tools that we can use to help us remember things. So thumb out again, visual data, the most powerful sensory input. And we'll remember that because the thumb is on top, visual data. And if you look at these two brains, um, that part that I circled there is the back of your brain. It's called your occipital lobe. So you can take your hand, touch the back of your head. Occipital lobe is where we have our vision function. So just thinking about it, we have two eyes in the front of our brain or in the front of our head and our occipital lobe is all the way in the back. Um, and vision being so important, I can just imagine that all of those nerves and things that go from the front of your head to the back of your head, it could get skewed you know, along the way. Um, so right now with two of our eyes, we are seeing that this is a screen, that this are, these are two brains in front of us. And with dementia, as the brain atrophies and the cells wither and die over time, um, as we can see in the picture, that connection from the front of our head to the back of our head, it's, uh, it's not as good as it used to be. Um, so some other differences you see in this picture, uh, you may notice that one brain is obviously a little smaller, looks a little shrunken. One of them is more darker in color there's more spaces, more crevices between the actual brain parts itself. And the interesting thing about these two brains is that the one on the right, um, it's actually one third of the weight or mass 
than the one on the left. So it doesn't look like, I mean, it's shrunken, but it doesn't look like it's one third of the size. The interesting part about this is that the inside of the brain also has these holes, also has these atrophies. So it's not just the outside of the brain, it's the whole brain itself. There are physical changes that are going on with the brain. Um, so these two brains, one was taken from a normal aged male, one from a normal aged, or not, sorry, one from normal age and one from a, a male that passed away with Alzheimer's disease. Um, they were both 86 years old upon death, same circumference of the skull. So it's not like one brain could grow bigger than the other. Um, the only difference here is that one male had Alzheimer's. Um, but luckily enough for us, you know, they were fortunate enough to donate their brains to science and they allowed us to help us understand what Alzheimer's people are going through. Um, so getting back on topic here, thumb means vision. Vision is the most powerful sensory input. Vision is king. In the back of our head is our occipital lobe where we hold our vision capabilities. Okay, so put out your pointer finger and bring it to your ear. Auditory data, auditory. So we have vision and then we have auditory. Auditory is the second way that human beings with dementia or not dementia like to take in data. So going back to vision, if you right now heard a huge crash behind you, what's the first thing you would do? You'd probably look behind you to see what's going on. If you're swimming in the ocean, playing with your friends or family and something brushes up against your leg, first thing you would do besides scream, you would probably look. You wanna see what that is before you do anything else because maybe you like it. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's a shark. You don't know until you look. So that's also why vision is king. Second way, auditory. So what, as care partners, instead of caregivers, we call it care partners because it's not the person that we're giving care to. We're trying to do with them. So we're partnering. We're doing it as partners. So care partners, we love to talk. Right now you signed up for this one hour video of me talking to you um, in a lecture style. So we, as human beings, we love to talk, we love to listen. Um, we have different ways of learning, of course, but care partners, we love to talk. But the person living with dementia is more focused on how we look visually and they have challenges processing the content of our speech. So in this picture here, again, the one on the left is the normal aged person. The one on the right is the person with Alzheimer's. And this green circle that you see on your screen is the part of the brain where we uh, understand language. So it's the part where we process the content of our speech. So right now you can hear 10 out of 10 words that I'm saying. You can put that through your ear and into this portion of your brain to understand every single word that I'm saying. But in this Alzheimer's brain, unfortunately, uh, with that deterioration, they can't hear 10 out of 10. And it starts with 10 out of 10, then it goes to 9 out of 10, and then 8 out of 10, 5 out of 10, and then eventually 2 out of 10, 1 out of 10. And I mean, if you miss a few words here and there, you can more or less make out what I'm trying to tell you. Um, but with dementia, if you are missing 8 out of 10 words that I'm saying, the chances of you understanding what I'm trying to ask you to do is very low. Um, so that could be why we are seeing challenges with the um, care that we're giving to the person. We tell them, come on, let's stand up, we're going to lunch. And maybe they only heard come and lunch, the first and the last word. And so they're sitting there staring at you because they're looking at you visually, wondering what you're saying. They don't understand what you're saying. Um, so really simplifying what we say and kind of how we say it, pairing it with a visual cue. Come, let's go, walking. Um, it could really help communicate with your person with dementia since they're looking at us visually. Vision is king, remember that. Uh, right. <clears throat> so this next part, um, the red circle, that is the part of our brain where we hear sounds. So in our brain, when we, when the noise or my words comes to the ear, it goes through that red part, that red circle, um, and you hear what I'm saying. You hear everything I'm saying, that my voice is going up and down, maybe I have rhythm in my speech, but you can hear all of that. It's that bottom part, that green circle, 
that is a tricky part. Um, so a good example I do in my workshops is that when I'm speaking to you and the sound goes through the heart of your head and it goes on and you can hear everything I'm saying, right? And it doesn't have me, but it's your head. But when it comes down to the bottom, you don't understand my head. So that was probably an overdramatic uh, example. But what I want to reiterate is that that red circle, you can hear what I'm saying. It's that green circle that you don't understand what I'm saying. So it, it might sound mumbled or fuzzy, or you might miss, like I said, eight out of 10 words. And this is a, a huge thing with dementia because we always think like, oh, she can't hear me. Let me just speak louder. If I yell at her, then maybe she'll hear me. Um, or me, okay, she forgot her hearing aid. So let me go get it. Let me put it in. Or maybe I need to clean her ears. We think it's something with their hearing. And sometimes it might be. There are people with dementia who also have hearing aids or need hearing aids, and that's fine. But if that's not the problem, if you, if you put the hearing aid in and you find that you're still having difficulties with them carrying out tasks, it could be because they're not understanding what you're saying. You could be speaking perfectly clear. You're speaking English, but what you're saying, they hear you. They just don't understand you. Um, and so that was I'm what sure I Siri is saying. I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, but that's what I wanted to reiterate. So vision is always king. If you look happy, they'll perceive you as a happy person. If you look angry, then they'll perceive you as an angry person. And when you open your mouth to talk, make sure it's simple. Use four words instead of 10, or maybe even two with a visual cue to help them understand what you're saying. So instead of saying, let's go to lunch, we have roast beef today. You can say, hey, lunchtime, lunchtime, come. So pairing vision with your verbal will really help you. Okay, now put out your middle finger. I can't do that on screen. So you can do it this way too. Middle finger, we're gonna take that, drop it down to the back of your hand and rub gently. This is touch data. So we have vision, we have verbal, and then we have touch. So when we touch something, we figure out if we like it or not. And if you like it, you'll probably do more of it. Now flip your hand over, gently rub your palm, for me, it's a little bit more tickly, more irritating, so I would want to stop. But based on what I touch and what I feel, I decide if I like it or if I don't like it. And we put the middle finger up on purpose because we do not want to start an interaction this way. We don't want to start by touching. If you touch first without doing a vision, a visual, and a verbal cue, then you're in for trouble. Um, the person living with dementia, they need time to process things around them. They're very sensitive to touch and they are easily startled, which could lead to unwanted behaviors. So, um, what is it called? We're gonna take our finger again. Now point up. We're gonna point up for fright. Point behind you in the back for flight. I wanna get out of here. And then bring out your middle finger again for fight. So we have fright, flight, and fight. These are the three common responses um, of a person with and without dementia. Um, based on how you approach them, they will react in a certain way. I guess the fourth way could be to respond normally um, instead of having these responses. But if we do touch first, you will see your person either get frightened and they might freeze in place. They might try to back away from you, try to get away, try to flight, or they might start fighting you. They might kick, they might punch, some of them bite, some of them pinch, and it's just their response. It's a natural response to the way that you are perceived. So if you come up to somebody and you look angry, they're gonna have reservations about you already before you even open your mouth. If you come up all happy-go-lucky with a huge smile, then of course they're gonna perceive you as somebody friendly, somebody that I want in my space. So yeah, come here, let's have a cookie, or I'll, do, I'll go to the bathroom with you. It depends on your approach as a caregiver um, that really, triggers their response. And these are the top three responses that we see primarily with dementia. Okay, so we have three zones of space. Public space is greater than six feet apart from the other person. And in this space, six feet apart, put up your thumb again, we're able to locate the other person visually. So um, imagine it's 
grandma's birthday, um, or in my case, it's grandma's birthday, and we go to a Chinese restaurant. And you know, Chinese restaurants are very loud. Um, the waitresses are coming around with the cars, pushing, everybody's talking, there's loud chatter. And I come in late with my present or my lay, and I'm looking around, right? I'm looking for my family. Where is my party? Is it in the front? Is it in the back? I'm scanning visually to find where they are. And let's say I walk in the front door and they're all the way in the back. And my Auntie Sil, Auntie Sylvia, she sees me, so she waves. She gets my visual attention. That's an ex uh, example of public space. So we're far away from each other in this crowded area where it's too loud to have a conversation. Um, and obviously I can't touch her, I'm so far away. So she gets my attention visually. Hey Mabu, we're over here. The next one is personal space, six feet or within arm's length. So arm's length is if you're standing in front of someone, your fingertips are touching. You, you're not really going past that, just your fingertips are touching. So within arm's length. And in this space, you're able to have a conversation. So back to my example, I see Auntie Sylvia waving her hand. I walk over, I come closer, we're in um, arm's length. And so I say, hi, Auntie Syl, where's grandma? Or, you know, you start a conversation, how are you? Um, this looks great, you know, something to introduce myself and say hello. Um, and personal space, again, conversation is with our pointer finger auditory. So we did a visual cue. Now we're close enough in personal space to have a conversation. I'm going to say something. And the last one is intimate space. So within arm's length or three feet. So if you have a partner, you can stand across of them and from personal space, but when you're touching fingertips, you come in, your fingertips will now touch the shoulder. You're within arm's length, three feet or less. Um, and that's within touching distance. So that's the middle finger, touching distance. She got my attention visually, Auntie Sil. She got my attention visually, came in closer for a conversation. And now that we're close enough, and I've already introduced, I said, hello, hi, how are you? Now we can touch. So now I mean, if I came in angry, she probably wouldn't want to touch me, but I came in happy. So she allows me to hug her. I hug her hello, and then we go about the celebration. Um, and this three zones of space, vision, conversation, and touch is very important to remember when you are approaching your person with dementia, um, taking into account, are they seated or are they standing? How should I approach? you always wanna get their visual attention first. And we start by six feet apart or more because people with dementia, they need more time to process what they see. Um, they can see, um, some of them might need corrective lenses and such, but they can see, they just in their brain need a little bit more time to process what is what they see. Um, so starting six feet apart gives them a good heads up. Um, and once you're in their visual field, say I'm walking into a care home and uh, Margaret is seated at the table and she just finished her breakfast or so she's reading the paper. I wanna start six feet away from her visually. And since the chatter is not too loud, maybe I can say, hey, Margaret, start a conversation walking in slow. How are you today? By that time, I probably have her visual um, attention. She's looking at me walking in towards her and flip the script on the patient side as if I'm Margaret, if I see Mapuana walking towards me, she got my attention, I'm busy reading my paper. She got my attention, I'm looking at her, I'm trying to figure out, is this person who I like? Do I not like her? Does she look happy? Does she look angry? What's her agenda, right? I mean, all people do that with dementia, without dementia. Um, when we see somebody, especially a stranger, walking up to me, we're like, okay, what do they want? What do they want? Should I engage, should I not? Um, should I pretend that I need to go to the bathroom? Um, that's what the person with dementia is doing too. They're trying to figure out, do I want to interact? And as you come closer in normal situations, especially with a stranger, we reach your hand out for a handshake. And that in a nonverbal way is asking, can I touch you? So as I approach Margaret, I'm gonna say, hey Margaret, how you doing? Reach my hand out for a handshake. If she grabs it and I'm in her intimate space, that means I'm okay to touch her. If she doesn't raise her arms at all, then that probably means don't touch me. I don't know you. And it's these little things as a caregiver that we need to be aware of. And of course it takes time and practice and you will mess up, but that's the beauty of caregiving. Um, we have chances every day to try something new. Even with dementia, you know, they forget. So maybe even every hour you can try something new. 
Um, but there will be those moments where you do fail and things will get hairy and scary. But just keep having that positive attitude and you'll find it eventually. Try something different. So keep in mind public space, get their visual regard, personal space when you can have a conversation and intimate space is when you can see if they allow you to start touching. Okay, so central and peripheral vision diagram. Um, we'll start on the bottom, 25 years old. So hopefully you have space and I hope you're doing this whether you're in the office or such. You're gonna hold your hands out to a 180 degree. So straight out, left and right, straight out. And then make a circle so it goes up and down. 25 years old, this is about the visual field that 25 years old have. So right now, if I'm folding my hands out to my sides, looking straight ahead, not moving my eyes side to side, keeping it straight on a focal point, and I wiggle my fingers, can't see, I'm wiggling my fingers on the outside. I honestly can see my fingers wiggling at 180 degrees. For some of us who may be older, you might have to move your, your hands in a little bit so that you can see where your fingers wiggle. Um, just taking note that whatever's behind your hand is your peripheral vision, whatever is lost. So the closer you move your hands in, the more peripheral vision or side vision um, is lost. Uh, whatever is the palm of your hand on the inside is what you can see. And with this diagram I have here, peripheral vision closes or narrows over time. So we're here at 25 years old, 180 degrees. You're gonna bring it in about 20 degrees. So this is a bad visual but um, bringing it in 20 degrees and still making that circle because peripheral vision is not just out to the sides, it's top, it's bottom, it's diagonal, it's all around us. Uh, so 20 from 180, now we're at 160, you're making that circle and imagining about 50, 40 to 50 years old, this is about where your visual field might be. Everybody differs, um, we age differently, some of us have um, visual impairments that might need corrective lenses or contact lenses, uh, right? There's macular degeneration, cataracts, all kinds of things. But in a normally aging person, this is approximately the field of vision that we have. Now we're going to bring it in about 20 more degrees. So let's see, that's 140, about 140 degrees, making that circle again. And this here is about equivalent to wearing a scuba mask. So if you can make two C's, connect your fingers together and bring it up to your eyes. And just kind of look around for a little bit. Try to see what you, or try to notice what you can and cannot see. Uh, if you have to look down at your shirt, what do you notice? You can't just move your eyes anymore. You need to move your entire head. If you wanna take a look to your left, if your eyes shift to your left, you still can't see, your peripheral vision is gone, so you need to move your head. We need to move our entire head, we need to rotate on our neck in order to see what's going on around us. And this could be with normal aging as well. So 75 degrees, remember top, bottom, left and right. You're walking, um, let's say in the forest, if you go hiking, and maybe you might not see that low lying branch, you might bump your head. Or you might be walking, in the mall and not see that little lounge chair and you might trip over it. It's our peripheral field that is diminishing over time. Cool, so center of gaze, we're gonna bring our hands in front of you about 12 inches apart, about, about 12 inches apart and still make that circle. That is our center of gaze, so right in front of you. And that is equivalent to a binocular uh, simulation, so making circles with two hands and bring your fingers together, bring it up to your eyes. Now look around. What do you notice? You can go from scuba vision down to binocular and notice the difference. Scuba vision again, and now binocular. Binocular view um, is very curious oriented. So we have a lot of curiosity in this stage of dementia and not so much safety awareness. So you might have thought that maybe Margaret stands up to go to the bathroom without her walker because she's trying to be non-compliant or defiant. But if she's in this stage, 
she sees the bathroom. She doesn't see her walker. And remember, her memory is impaired. Her brain is not functioning as well as it used to. So she might think that she's in her 30s. I don't need a walker. And even if she did see the walker, why do I need a walker? You know, so it's the caregiver that needs to come over. And instead of freaking out, notice that maybe she's getting a little antsy. And before she stands up, bring over her walker. Hey, Margaret, where are you going? Oh, don't forget your walker. It'll help you walk today. You going to the bathroom? Would you like some assistance? Um, being proactive as a caregiver really helps. Um, so we're trying to decrease the amount of frustration and anxiety that we as caregivers have. I've seen it in the clinical setting. Maybe Margaret is at the far dining table and she wants to go to the bathroom. So she stands up, she starts walking without her walker and the nurse is screaming, Margaret, Margaret, sit down, you're gonna fall. Don't do that, where's your walker? And I'm sure most of you who work in a facility or clinical setting have seen something similar to that where they are far away from the resident and the resident is doing some unsafe behavior. Um, that could all be avoided if we as caregivers become detectives and we notice that Margaret is getting fidgety before she stands up or we know that Margaret usually goes after lunch to the bathroom. So we have her walker right in front of her. Um, thinking ahead, it is gonna be a challenge at first, but once you have those uh-ohs, it could lead to ahas. Ah just keep trying things. So you will see patterns over the time. Margaret will every day after lunch, go to the bathroom to pee. That's her new routine. She might not have done it before, but since it happened four days in a row, it'll probably happen the fifth day in a row. Um, so just thinking ahead, noticing these um, patterns that are going on with your person and trying to be proactive in the situation. So vision is very important to recognize. Um, and it's not easy to determine with your person. I can't tell you that in mid-stage, she'll be equivalent to a scuba mask or at 85, she will have that binocular center of gaze. Um, I would say to test it out by using those wiggly fingers. So if I'm here, if I'm Margaret and I'm looking at my, my newspaper or my magazine in front of me, um, it might look weird, but try to come from the side, stand in back and just wiggle your fingers and keep coming closer and closer to whatever I'm looking at. And when she notices it, she'll say, what the hell are you doing? But then you'll know, oh, that's about her peripheral vision. So if I want her to drink her coffee, I'm going to put it here. I'm not going to put it here. You know, um, vision is very important. And it, I can't tell you what their vision is at what specific time. It's up to us to test it out and try different things along the way. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to um, tap, type it in the chat bar at any time. Wrong button. There we go. Cool, so body positioning. As caregivers, we don't, well, I can't speak for all of us, but I, when I started out, I didn't realize how important body language is. Um, so positioning your body in a confrontational stance versus a supportive stance, it sends a message. Um, so if you have a partner right now, or later on, if you remember, try this out with your partner. We're going to talk about confrontational stance first. So understanding the difference between confrontational and supportive stance. And I hope you guessed correctly, but supportive stance is what we want to be in when we are talking to our person with dementia. So confrontational stance is standing directly in front of another person. It is seen as aggressive, more demanding, and the caregiver is filling your visual field. So the person feels trapped, um, especially with your limited vision. If you're in the scuba binocular phase, um, somebody standing right in front of you in your center gaze, they will take up that entire field of vision that you have left. So this confrontational stance, I mean, if you think about it, who stands right in front of you? Usually somebody of authority. Um, I've heard doctors might stand in front of you telling you you need to take this medicine, you take it twice a week, blah, blah, blah. Um, who else? Maybe your boss, I need that paperwork done by this week. Or it could be your mom, why haven't you done the dishes yet? It could be your teacher, 
I need your report. Where's your report? It's past due. You always procrastinate, right? So it's kind of aggressive. It's demanding. Um, and if they do have this field of vision left, it could feel scary for the person with dementia. I wish we were in person right now so that we could try out this role play. Um, but when you have the chance, grab a partner, stand directly in front of them in personal space. So you're touching their shoulder, hold your arm out, touch their shoulder, go ahead and put on your binoculars or your scuba mask and have them just stand right in front of you and notice how it feels to have somebody right in front of you. And then we have supportive stance. So this one is standing on the side. Um, you're still in their visual field. So even if they have those um, visual acuities, uh, you can always see them, especially if you turn your head just slightly. But you are standing on the side, you're still in their visual field, and it feels more relaxed, it feels more friendly, and it opens the field of vision for the person with dementia so they can see their way out. Uh, I saw a video of Tipa Snow she did this example with, I think, four or five people in her class. And she moved to the side. So she was standing, let's say, right here. And it's about a 90 degree angle. So if I'm here, then the other person will be standing right on my side, shoulder to shoulder. And so Tipa Snow was standing here. And she said, if I stand here versus on the side, how does that make you feel? And he had his scuba mask on. And he said, I can still see you. But if I didn't want to see you, I can just turn my head. Versus if the person is standing right in front of you and you turn your head, they're just going to move their head too to get your attention because they might think you're not listening. Um, but they can see their way out. It's less threatening. Um, so if you do have a partner, I really encourage you to try out these two stances. Confrontational, standing directly in front of the person. And then supportive. So you're here standing in front of the person. All you do is shift your shoulder so that you're at about a 90 degree angle and you're not right next to or behind the person you're you're like this so this would be a shoulder this would be a shoulder ends of my hands are shoulders right in front on the side so if this were me right now this is my right shoulder here and this would be the person's left shoulder at about a 90 degree angle try that out when you have a chance and see how it feels for you especially when you put on those binoculars and those scuba vision masks. Wow, we're going through this fast. Um, okay, let's see. So I have a, a comment here. It says, my mother is 83 years old in a care home and she's blind in one eye. And my recommendation for that is to use her good eye. Um, so if it is the left side and it feels awkward, that's okay. I'd rather you be in her visual field than on this side talking to her when she can't see you. Because, I mean, imagine if you couldn't see and somebody was talking. I, honestly, I would feel a little frightened. I don't know who that is. I don't know where they're standing. Um, so just try to use her good eye and get into her visual field. Um, and you can still approach on that side. We do the hand under hand, which tries to utilize your dominant hand. Um, and if her dominant hand is right and she's blind in the right, you might want to start using the left just for the handshake portion so that she knows you're there. Um, and it's interesting that when people with dementia reach the later stages of dementia, they actually do go into monocular vision. So not saying that they become blind in one eye, but the visual field comes so small that it's like they have a mon monocle on. And towards the even later or end stages, it kind of opens and closes. So that's like their eye opening and closing. A lot of times when they're bed bound in the pearl stage, the last end stage, they're sleeping a lot more. So when they do open their eyes, it's, like an, it's, it's such an amazing moment to capture, but eventually they will close again. But for your mom, um, she does have one eye at least, so you can use more verbal and visual cue by getting on her more better side. Thank you for that comment. So the positive physical approach really encompasses everything that I've been talking about, your stance, the vision, going slow, personal space, visually, verbally, and then touch. And now we're just gonna wrap it all up into 
how to do the positive physical approach. And again, if you have a partner, this is much easier to do with a partner so that you can actually see it happening in action. So the first one, you wanna stop at six feet, which is public space to get into their visual field. Literally stop at six feet. Um, and even if you have to readjust your thoughts yourself, take a deep breath before you move on, that's fine too. But get into their visual field, meaning be in front of them at six feet away. You wanna make sure you look friendly, make eye contact and use the person's preferred name. Um, I know at the care home, they discourage the use of sweetie or auntie or grandma, um, endearments like that. We wanna use their first name or their last name. And you can figure out their preferred name when you introduce yourself. So you'll say, hi, I'm Mabu and you are? And they'll tell you, they might even tell you, call me auntie, which is fine, that's their preferred name. Um, just make sure that they prefer it. Even with my mom, when we are in crowded situations, she doesn't have dementia, but to get her attention, I call her by her first name. Instead of saying, mom, 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 I say, Pat, Pat, I'm over here. And she'll look more better. Because if we're in a public space, everybody's name is mom, right? Everybody who has a kid, their name is mom. So we want to use their preferred name. All right. So you are still at six feet. You're adjusting yourself to look friendly. You are setting yourself up to make eye contact and you are trying to figure out what is their preferred name and maybe it's granny. So bring your open flat hand near your face so that they can see your face and your hand. Your hand is really the target to say, look here. And once it's by your face, they'll say, okay, I looked here. This is who's attached to it. And if you're a professional caregiver, it's good to put your name tag in this area so that they can say target, this is who I'm talking to and this is her name. And from there, you move in slowly and offer your hand out in the handshake position. So I'd bring my hand here, I'm still at six feet. Margaret, you know, say her preferred name with my hand here to get her attention. And then move in slowly offering your hand out in handshake position. So by this time, I'm walking in slowly, trying to get into her personal space, so less than six feet away, but not in her intimate where she can touch me just yet. If the person accepts your handshake offer, you can continue to move slowly, allowing them to track your movement, um, and then move into a supportive stance at arm's length and shake hands. So let's see, backing up, let's go to number four. So we're here, we're moving in slowly, my hand, is hand, my hand is out in handshake position. Let's say Margaret took my hand. We're shaking like normal. I'm still moving slowly in towards her and it's like a step per second. So you can count in your head if you have to, but one step, one second, one step, a second, a step, a second, just so that the person you're approaching has more time to process what's going on. Um, so they ex Margaret accepted my handshake. I'm moving slow. Um, I'm moving into supportive stance. So as I'm walking in, we're here at confrontational and my hand is out for a handshake, she's accepted. As I come in closer, I'm gonna take her hand and then move my body out to her side so that I can be in supportive stance at arm's length, shaking her hand. And then from that handshake, I'll teach you next the hand under hand position and then you can offer your name. So, just like in America, I'm not sure in other countries, but we normally greet each other with a handshake, right? When we first introduce myself, hi, I'm Mapu. Handshake for a few times, and then after we shake, normal thing to do is let go. But the person with dementia, we as a caregiver want to stay connected. We want them to feel connected to us. Um, so that is what the hand under hand position offers. Um, Okay, so I can put it all together again, but the way that you offer your name in number seven, after you do the hand under hand, you offer your name, hi, I'm Mapu, and you are? And of course, if you already know the person, you can move on to, what you doing? Or I like that shirt. How's it going today? You know, what can I help you with? So a different way to introduce yourself, especially if it's your own mom, it'd be kind of weird to say, hi, I'm Mapu, and you are your mom, duh. No, yeah, that's right. Um, so moving back to the top, one more time recap with a positive physical approach. We're at six feet in public space in their visual field right in front of them. 
Um, they may be looking down, but I am right in front of her. I want to make sure I look friendly, fix my shirt maybe, have a smile on, making eye contact, searching for her eyes, using the person's preferred name, Margaret, bringing my hand to my face so that they can see both. Hi, Margaret, coming in slowly. Even my hand gesture can be slow, offering my hand out in handshake position. Margaret takes my hand and I move slow towards her, shaking a few times, moving into supportive stance. So from here, my body would shift out this way. And then from our handshake, I'd go into hand under hand position. Hi, Margaret. Good morning. And maybe she doesn't like being called Margaret and I'm trying to figure out what does she want to be called. So hi. Not even say Margaret. Hi, I'm Mapu and you are? Or hey, how are you doing today? Something friendly, of course, um, to get their attention and visual regard. Okay, let's see. Somebody has commented, in addition to dementia, my mother also had glaucoma, which added to the field of vision impairment. <sighs> That's tough, um, but definitely common. So a lot of people with dementia will have other chronic um, complications. So they might have dementia and diabetes or congestive heart failure or COPD or in your case glaucoma. Um, we had this one resident, I think it was macular degeneration, but she would look at an activity. I used to do activities as well. She would look at an activity and I would say, okay, here's a pen, trace this. It could be connect the dots or maybe I drew something for her. Okay, trace this. And she would only do like one half of it. And uh, I just didn't understand until her daughter came in and did the activity with her. And I was like, oh, she finished it today. Yesterday, she was having some difficulties. What did you do different? It's always a team approach. Um, so she's like, oh, well, my mom has macular degeneration in her left eye. So I try to help her out with the hand. And I move her hand on the left side that she can't do. And then she does the right side independently. So understanding what impairments they do have, we can work with the abilities that they still have. And that's what the positive approach to care tries to emphasize. Uh, Tipa Snow came up with a different model of staging dementia um, and she calls them gems instead of whatever else they call it. Um, a lot of times it's on a numeric scale. So your mother is a seven out of seven or a one of seven or a three out of six. And a lot of times those scales, it, it's just really confusing. Um, there's also mild, moderate, severe, regressive, mild cognitive impairment, a lot of different ways to state what the person is experiencing. And if you go from one doctor to another doctor, they might use different ways of explaining the stage your mom or dad are in. Um, but with this GEMS approach, Tipa Snow brings it in a more positive light. So there are six gems. First one is Sapphire, which is true blue, normal aging. That's you and I right now, normal aging. And then there is diamonds, which we think of as rigid. It's cutting, it's sharp, it's clear, but there's some confusion focused about the money. That's the early stages. And then we have emerald. Emeralds are what color? They're green. So emerald in that stage, they're on the go. They want to go someplace, especially in the afternoons when they're sundowning. I need to go home. I need to pick up my children. My husband is waiting for me. I need to cook dinner. Um, so they're always on the go. They need something to do. And in a true emerald, there's always a flaw. Man-made ones, they're, they're flawless. But in a true emerald, there's always a flaw. And emeralds, they may or may not understand that something's wrong. Um, but when you try to correct them, whew, good luck with that. They come back fighting. They hate to be corrected. The next one after that is amber. So ambers are, uh, it's a toss up. It could be yellow, it could be orange, it could be brown. Um, there's a lot of ways to view what an amber is. But in that stage, they are slowing down and they're more focused on sensations. So sensations of the hands, the mouth, genitalia, the feet, they're focused on what feels good to them. And I think in this stage too, they are hoarders. They like to grab things that aren't theirs and take it. Um, after that one, we have red, which is ruby. So rubies are nice, bright, and red. We assimilate that to a stop sign, which pretty much means that uh, 
motor functions are slowing down. So fine motor in the hands, in the feet, in the mouth, um, they're having more difficulties with. So fine motor tasks, maybe eating, they don't use a fork anymore. They use their hands. Um, maybe they can't use chopsticks anymore. They use their fingers. Um, a lot of times you'll see them grab with their strength fingers rather than manipulating with their skill fingers. So that's in the ruby stage. And then the last stage is the pearl. And if you think about a pearl um, in a shell, what kind of shell does a pearl come in? Comes in an oyster. And what does the outside of an oyster look like? It's kind of rough, maybe ashy, ash colored, gray. It's not very pretty, right? It's kind of ugly to see, but the pearl inside is very beautiful. And just like people with dementia, when they're bed bound, when their contractures set in, when they're in that bed, when they can't talk, when they're difficult to feed, it's not very pretty to see. But as caregivers, we need to look past the shell and try to figure out how can we get that shell to open so that I can see their pearl inside. And that's why Tipa Snow is so amazing because she comes up with all of this and is putting it out in the world for us to teach. Okay, let's move on. So another comment, if the person with dementia has forgotten how we are related, let's say she's my grandma, but she doesn't remember, would it be upsetting to her to be addressed as grandma? Should family adjust and call her by her first name? That's a great question. Um, and I am not looking forward to the day that my grandma experiences that, or I experience that with my grandma, uh, but that is very common. So a lot of times what we see in the care home is people come up, maybe it's the daughter, she comes in, she's, hey mom, which one am I? And honestly, if you don't know this person, how are you supposed to respond, you know? Um, uh, you're the tall one, or you're the pretty one, just to make them feel better, right? But it's very upsetting for the person with dementia when they don't recognize you and you recognize them and they understand more times than not that this person knows me, they must be related to me, but I don't, I don't understand what the connection is. Um, I actually wrote a poem about that. It's, um, it's in one of the Generations magazines, but um, I would recommend that you try to use this positive physical approach and instead of saying grandma, try to offer your name and then see what she says in return and then go from there because she might remember you one day and say, oh, I'm Harriet, your grandmother, remember? And then you'll feel enlightened because she remembered that day. And if she doesn't remember, then that's okay. You know, you already started off on the right foot instead of just saying, hey, grandma, how you doing? And she's like, who are you? Right? So... Um, give her a chance to introduce herself um, because even throughout one day, one day's period, their brain changes a lot throughout the entire day. Chemical changes, there's chemicals that are going, there's chemicals that are coming. Um, so just giving her that opportunity to introduce herself is what I would recommend. And then one more comment is staring common with dementia. I thought that was a typo, sorry. Is staring common with dementia? Um, I like to say yes, because I mean, if you're in this field of vision and something huge is happening to the left or the right of me, I'm not paying attention to it. You know, I can't even see it. So why would I look around? Um, a lot of times people with dementia, you might notice when they're walking with their walker, somebody on the side is saying, hey, Harriet, they're not going to look this way with their head. They're going to turn their whole body and then look. So it takes more time, more, I want to say muscles, um, more brain processing to look around than it is to stare. Um, especially with this binocular vision, there are two types of tasks that we have. So we're looking down at my paper is called task vision. So I'm, I'm focused on eating or I'm focused on reading. And with this impaired visual ability, Honestly, all I can see is what's right in front of me. I can't see anything else. So if you stand in front of me and you start talking, I can't see you. I'm not going to listen to you. I need to switch from task vision. Give me some time to process. I'll come up, look at you. And this is called social vision. So now I can socialize, but I need that extra time to make that switch from what I'm doing here to, okay, let me refocus to here. Now I see you. 
now you can talk. And it might be maybe three seconds or so, but um, let's say I, let's say you approached me, I'm a person with dementia and I'm here looking at the newspaper. What I would recommend is you come either on the side or right in front of me and you say, hey mom, or hey Harriet, to get my visual attention for me to look up. And that's all you say and you wait until I come up here and I look at you. And you can wait till I say something or you can wait till I'm just looking at you, but that's when you start your speech. Um, because if I'm here and you approach, hey Harriet, today we're gonna go to the dentist and they're gonna take out your crown and put a bridge and blah, blah, blah. I'm not listening to anything you're saying. You're not in my field of vision. I'm not focused on you. So you need to wait a few seconds until I'm, I'm here. And then also simplify what you say. But yeah, I would say staring is pretty common with dementia. So we have the positive physical approach that I hope you practice. And let me show you the hand under hand. So number one, we are going in for a regular handshake. If you have a person with you, you can practice right now. I would highly recommend you practice this. Um, I also like to call this my super cool caregiver handshake because only caregivers do it, no. Um, but hand under hand technique. So number one, you're going in for a regular handshake. Number two, you grab the hand in a regular handshake. And in this stage, you shake a few times to say hello. Three, and this is the tricky part, the person with dementia is not going to be doing this with you. They're, it's up to the caregiver to make the switch. But you move your hand up into, we call it a butterfly or a bird position. And then you gently wrap your fingers around. So one, two, three, four, one, going in for the handshake, two, shaking a few times, three, make that switch into the bird, number four, gently wrap your fingers around, number five, this is what we look like, that is my fellow pack trainer, Sarah Tompkinson, um, so you wrap your fingers around, and that's my left arm approaching her, and then number six, supportive stance, so I'm right on the side, and as I talked about before, that 90 degree angle, um, my left shoulder to her right shoulder and then my left hand is resting on her shoulder to for added support um, i sometimes put it on the others the opposing side shoulder or even around the hips depending on what task we're doing and then number six on the bottom you see our hands are joined i am the caregiver in this situation and as a caregiver i'm here to support the person with dementia so my hand is always on the bottom it's always on the bottom. Person with dementia is on top. And if you put up these first three fingers, remember vision, verbal, and then touch, these three fingers also serve as our skill fingers. So if you think about writing with a pen, these are the three fingers that you will most likely be manipulating to write with. If you think about buttoning buttons on your shirt or your pants, you will probably use these three fingers, sewing something, these are our skill fingers. The last two fingers are our strength fingers. So we use these to grip things. If you think about holding a hammer to get more leverage, we would grasp more so with the last two fingers. Opening up a jar, we grip it with those last two fingers to get more traction. Um, so skill fingers versus strength fingers. Skill fingers as a caregiver is what we are able to use in this hand under hand technique. The person with dementia, they have to use their strength fingers. All they have to do is hold on. And with this, I should have put a video in there, but with this technique, um, you can see my hand is on the bottom and my fingers are available. So I can hold a spoon for her or the hairbrush. And all she does is hold on. And as I'm manipulating the spoon, her arm is going with me. So she feels like she's doing it. And I can narrate, okay, let's scoop. Now bring it to the mouth, mmm, scoop, bring it to the mouth, isn't that yummy? Or we're gonna brush your hair, and then I would have it in my hand as a caregiver. She just holds on to my hand. We're gonna brush the right side. Good brushing, let's try the left side. So the person with dementia, they feel like they are participating in their care, and therefore they are less likely to feel threatened and act out in crazy behaviors. Um, versus if I'm sitting in front of her and I'm feeding her myself without 
any interaction from her. She's just sitting with her hands in her lap. That's kind of scary because this is my mouth. You know, I'm, I might be 85, but I've fed myself for a good 70 years or 75 years. I can feed myself. They think, you know, I can do it by myself. So let's give them that, that added independence and do it with them. Cause maybe they can do it. They're just really messy and we might not want to get any food on this table or on the carpet. So I'll help you do it. Um, but if you have a partner, you can try out this hand under hand technique and I would recommend either a hairbrush or a spoon or fork and just try to try it for yourself um, or with your person, I should say. So try it, try feeding with them and then sit on the side and feed, just feed them yourself. Bring the, the spoon, shove it in their mouth, shove it in their mouth. I mean, you're not shoving it, of course you're being gentle, but having that extra support and that feeling that I'm doing it to myself, it really adds to their um, independence, their dignity. They have more respect for you as a caregiver. Uh, and it's just, it's a win-win all over the place. So somebody else has uh, chatted. Uh, Hello, Hamapu. Thank you for being well prepared and presented an illustrated seminar. What percent of dementia patients suffer from combative or wandering behaviors? And what are some caregiving solutions to this? I do not have any statistics on that per se, but it depends what kind of dementia you have that helps or makes you become a wanderer. Um, and I want to say that your approach really matters that's why they become combative so if you are coming in you say okay it's feeding time i'm gonna feed you some of this versus using this hand under hand and say oh let's have some papaya how about some papaya and sitting next to them and spending that time to feed them um, using the positive physical approach to really think out how the other person is going to feel if i do this if i stand in front versus on the side it will lessen their chances of becoming combative um, so I'd recommend you really try out these different techniques that I'm helping you with today to, to uh, decrease the combative behaviors. For wandering, um, I want to, let's see, recommend that you give them an activity that they enjoy. Wandering leads to eloping, and usually in the emerald stage, the go-go-go stage, they are wanderers because they're trying to figure out a way to get out. And it might be their house and they say, I want to go home. Um, Tipa Snow was here last week and her advice for people that want to leave their house to go home is to take them around the block, take them out of their house for a little bit. And once you return, then they'll feel like they're actually home. They just need to get out for a little bit and see something other than this place, these four walls that I'm trapped in all day. Um, but wandering behaviors are usually due to inactivity. So if your person is finished with dinner or breakfast, let's say breakfast, and you just clear the table for them, they're sitting there with nothing to do, their brain is going, they're thinking, okay, I need to get out. After breakfast, I usually go for a walk or I usually go to work. So they're gonna get up and they're gonna go wandering. Um, so giving them something to do, like even wiping the placemats or putting the dishes away if they're able to do that, or they could help wash the dishes. I'm giving them an activity to do really helps. Good questions, guys. Thank you for um, chiming in. Okay, so supportive communication, creating a positive connection. After you've done the positive approach, you, you're in hand under hand. Lots of times people say, now what do I do? So you can offer your name. I'm Mapu and you are. Or you can offer a shared background. I'm from Waminalo and you're from. Or you can offer a positive personal comment. You look great in that purple dress. Or I love that color on you. Where did you get this? So something to connect with them. Um, not all the time you will be approaching them when they are calm. Sometimes they are agitated and approach you and say, I need the thing. And you're like, okay, what thing? I need the thing. And then by that time, their escalation is too high. You can't say, I'm Mabu and you are, you know, because then it'll just make them more agitated. So that's something else that we teach as well. Um, but today we're focusing on they're seated or standing and relaxed and you're here to approach them in a positive way. I recommend you start practicing this when they are relaxed, not agitated. Um, but these are some examples that you can um, bring up 
to help connect because especially if you're a professional caregiver um it'll be difficult to do the positive approach get the, into hand under hand i'm mop when you are margaret okay margaret let's go toilet you know it's like okay wait i just met you and now you want to take me to the toilet or take a bath or go to bed no thank you so all of that positive approaching hand under hand would have been for nothing um, making a connection before you bring out your agenda is very important. Um, so you can say, hi, I'm Mapu and you are Margaret. Nice. I'm from Waimanalo. You're from? Also giving them that prompt where if you say you're from or and you are, um, it tells them what you want them to say next. And then you can say like, oh, it's really hot in here. Let's go outside. Let's go cool down or let's go get a glass of water or it's too cold, let's go get a sweater. Using the word let's instead of you need is more of a team approach so that you're doing it with them instead of telling them what to do. Um, and that could also help to decrease combative behaviors. Okay, so hand under hand review. Um, it uses established nerve pathways in the palm. It's very comforting when you're in this hand under hand. It's comforting for, the, for your, whole, your whole body, for the caregiver, for the person with dementia, if you practice this, you'll notice that you can move around pretty freely um, and still be attached with the person. Um, it allows you to, or it allows a person with dementia to feel in control since they're doing it with you, connects you to the person physically, and it allows you to do with them rather than to them, gives advance notice of possible problems. So if they feel a little shaky and you're walking with them, you want to motion for somebody to bring a chair or find the nearest place that they can sit so that you can sit them down. Gives advance notice. Oh, I just said that. It connects eye-hand skills. So another, another thing with the feeding, with the hand under hand, I'm just going to pretend. With the hand under hand, when you're feeding, try with your partner, try um, to have the person pretending to be the, with dementia to close their eyes and have it, have them, try to feel what it feels like to be doing it with you and then drop their hand and then just feed them without the hand under hand and see how that feels. Um, a lot of this positive approach to care is about putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Um, and that's really important because like personally speaking, I don't know how other people feel until I'm put through the same thing. Um, in my workshops, I tell people that, Family caregiving is so much different from professionally caregiving. I can go to the care home and care for 26 patients, no problem. But when it comes to my grandma, the, a lot of emotions come up, a lot of feelings. Um, I tried to use my grandma as an example one time and I started tearing up um, because you have that emotional connection. Prof professional caregiving, there's not much emotions or we're not supposed to have emotions tied into it but that's the big difference so um the last point use the dominant side of the person so if the person is left-handed they feed themselves with the left hand and you are right-handed you might have to get used to using your left hand to help feed them um, because if you make that switch say i'm right-handed and i always ate i always write with my right hand and my caregiver's left-handed and they tried to feed me with my left hand. It feels weird. Try that with your person. Feed them with the right hand and then feed them with the left hand. And it just, something feels wrong about it because it's not natural. It's not what I'm used to doing. Uh, we are down to the six minute mark. So if anybody else has more questions, please send them in via the chat box. Um, otherwise, I'm just gonna continue going on. What you can use hand under hand for, Connecting, comforting, gazing, um, and directing gaze. So the pump, when you are in this hand under hand position, um, you'll, you can try this out with your partner, with you underneath to support, give a little squeeze or a little pump and see what that does. So we use this to, again, direct gaze. So if the person you're feeding um, is distracted for a little bit, maybe your supervisor came over, talked to you about a different patient, and now you have to start feeding again, but the person with dementia is so focused on what Nancy is doing on the side to get her attention instead of like grabbing her face and pulling it towards you or calling out her name seven times. Try giving a little pump, a little pump, Nancy or Margaret, 
a little pump, a little pump, not too hard. It is very comforting as well, but it will help to get their attention in a non-verbal way. So you can get their eye contact and attention. Um, hand under hand can be used to guide and help with movement. Um, I can't really show you how to do this right now um, through the computer, but with this hand under hand and then with your partner, get into hand under hand, take your left hand, wrap it around their waist and walk with them and try to see how that feels. Um, this is a good way to walk with somebody who has forgotten their walker. Ooh, where is it? Um, so when you catch them in the hallway, their walkers all the way in the dining room, you run around and you do this hand under hand, you walk with them back to their room or to the toilet, wherever they were going. Once they're seated in a safe position, you can go and grab their walker and bring it. Um, that's what I would use it for mostly in uh, dire situations. So another comment, oh, you need to get back to work. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm wondering why my mother cries in panic whenever she's left alone. Think about yourself if you were left alone, especially if you have a child alone. I'm sure they would have the same kind of reaction. Um, but your mother also seems like, well, in your situation, I don't know you, but it seems like you are the main caregiver, possibly caregiving at home. And um, when you, maybe even as simple as leave her bedroom to go make her breakfast, she could be crying in panic, um, which could mean that she's very attached to you as her sole caregiver. So when, even if you bring in somebody from the outside to come in and relieve you, she might still be in this crying panic mode. Um, and that's very scary for you as the caregiver because we need respite too, right, as caregivers. So finding somebody else that she can trust and bringing them in to gain rapport with her, it might uh, alleviate you to give you time to do whatever you wanna do. Um, but also, um, she might be idle, doing nothing. And so all she has time to think about is, I'm alone. I'm alone. What do I do? I'm alone. I don't know what to do. Um, so maybe giving her an activity might help. Hey, mom, can you fold these laundry while I go and get something from the kitchen? And if her mind is engaged in the task, then she has lower chances of thinking, I'm alone. Um, so maybe try and give her some activities because her brain is focused on I'm alone. That's all she can think about right now. She has nothing else to do. And I may or may not be correct. Um, just trying things out, of course, as caregivers is what we can do now. Um, so Kimberly says, wonderful presentation. Thank you for your time. Um, another person, thank you. I need to be leaving now. Thank you all for tuning in. And I'll just go wrap up now. Okay, good, so questions, use a chat box. Otherwise, there's my information. You can always shoot me an email. Um, I'd love to answer your questions or invite you to one of my future workshops where I would have more time to talk about all of these things. But before I do go, I would like to give a shout out to next month. So next month in July 25th, same time, 11.30, we have two speakers, um, Thomas Rulon and Laurie Adamschick. They will be talking about protecting against identity theft, scams, and financial exploitation. Uh, I will be sending this flyer out on July 1st, and then the next week, and I think the following week as well, for you folks to register. Um, so just keep your eye out for the Thursday, July 25th webinar. We do have August set up, September. If you're a member and you'd like to be uh, the next speaker for our webinars, you can also shoot me an email, hpgsmembers at gmail.com, and we can talk. Um, only requirement is that you are a member of HPGS. And if you're not and would like to speak, I can help you out with membership. Uh, so please stay tuned for July's webinar with Lori and Tom talking about identity theft. And then we have our July general membership meeting coming up on July 18th. It's a Thursday. 8.30 to 10.30 at Abe Lee Seminars, uh, which is 1585 Kapilani Boulevard, Suite 1518. So if you're a member, you are probably receiving my emails inviting you to our general membership meeting. Uh, we'd love to have everybody come. We're gonna have three speakers. The first one will be Senator Sharon Moriwaki from the Kupuna Caucus, giving a legislative update on the 2019 bills that relate to our Kupuna 
along with Carolyn Cotterau from the Executive Office on Aging. So if you have any questions for them, please show up or send me your emails and then I can ask for you. But um, we are very blessed to have those two ladies speaking about our upcoming bills. So that'll be great. And then we have Christy Nishida uh, with the, representing the Mayor's Age-Friendly Honolulu Initiative and its Kind to Kupuna Business Program. This is very interesting. So she will discuss this program that raises awareness on how to better support Kupuna customers from a business point of view um, and their clients with physical and cognitive disabilities. So input from our HPGS Kupuna members, uh, business members uh, on the program, we really invite you to give us your input on how we can be more kind to our Kupuna as businesses. So RSVP to Sherry Goya no later than July 11th and i think that's it if nobody has any more questions for me at the moment i'd like to really thank you for your time uh taking out this hour carving out this hour just to listen to my webinar um, and thank you for those who are returning people um hpgs members we do these every last thursday of every month um, different topics if you have a topic that you would like to hear about shoot me an email i'd love to hear from you folks other than that Thank you folks for tuning in and I wish you luck on your caregiving, whether professional or family. Thank you. Have a great day.